Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. Welcome to Conman's Current Events Roundtable. Again, we have a very special guest. Actually, we have very special two guests, but I want to welcome back one of my favorite rabbis, Rabbi Benyomin, <laughs> you, you have a difficult name, Scheinman. And he is with the Jewish prison, and he's a Jewish prison chaplain. And uh, also with uh, and welcome back because we, I remember we had a terrific show last time you were on and uh, we want to explain on the show again about the prison system and how you're so active in it, Rabbi. And also with our guest and today is Aaron Snowden, not a, not a relation to Edward Snowden, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. and he is a community organizer and he knows well about the prison system because years ago uh, he was an inmate there mm -hmm. and I am so happy that you're out and you're helping other people and you're doing a terrific job and we're going to be talking to our viewers and everybody about the prison system in Illinois and how how it differs also with the prison system in Sweden and Finland and what needs to be done. But first, uh, Rabbi, good to see you again. And um, you're still working uh, as a chaplain, correct, in the prison system. And I think you're doing a terrific job. And maybe you could tell us a little bit, our viewers, a little bit about what you do as a a rabbi, which is with Jewish prisoners, but I see that Aaron isn't a Jewish prisoner, right? No? Okay. No. So you're working with both now, and tell us a little bit about what's going on and how you started and, you know, what's, what you do, what your function is in the prison system. Well, I started back in 1980. It was the first time I went to a prison, and gradually uh, in the early 80s, I had a number of families approached our organization. I was working for Lubavitch Chabad of Illinois, Rabbi Moskowitz, a blessed memory. And um, as I got involved with this prison work, I felt a, like a calling, like this was something for my soul. And I made a decision that I want to visit every single person that goes to any county, state, or federal prison in the state of Illinois to give them comfort, to help them while they're there, support them and their families, and help them when they get out. And during my work, anybody is allowed to register as Jewish. That's why gentlemen such as Aaron have crossed my path, and I give them the same love and attention as I would someone of the Jewish faith because at the end of the day, isn't it all about helping a person and reaching the soul and telling someone how good they could be, um, like I'm sure you have read up about those other countries where the um, whole stress is about bringing out the goodness of the person and telling them how good they could become and then they do become good. Right. When you tell somebody that they're bad, they will, they'll be bad. And if you tell somebody they're good, they'll feel good. And Aaron, and we're going to talk about uh, the United States and how, you know, Finland and Sweden differs, but why did you go to, you know, you're a um, Christian and yet um, I think you worked with uh, um, chaplains that were Christian and yet you found uh, Rabbi Scheinman. How did that happen? Actually, I'm not a Christian. Uh, I'm, I'm what they call a Benny Noach. 
which is the son of Noah. And um, were you originally? Originally, you were at born? the time when I met Rabbi Shaim, and I didn't identify as Christian. Okay. I was going through a period where I was trying to figure out what faith I wanted to believe in. So, okay. Uh, the closest that it came to was the Jewish faith. Really? Because your your mother, she wasn't. She, she was Christian. She was, she was Christian. Was okay. So that so I want to make sure. Yeah, that I had I had fell away from that that, okay. that belief system. Okay. And when I met the rabbi, there was a few choices on the list in prison where you could go and try to find someone to 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 speak to on the level that you wanted to speak to them on. And just so happens, the the closest I came to what I wanted to learn was uh, Judaism. And so, in order to see a Jewish rabbi, I had to put Jewish on my uh, uh, list of what I believe is a religion. So I did get to meet the rabbi, and when he came in, he was kind of surprised because he says, well, usually we just come here to see Jewish people, but he was open to seeing me, and uh, he was uh, a really good guy, you know. And I was a little concerned at first that I might not see him again because of that, but he showed up, so. Yeah, because we've had on our show, we had a rabbi that was African-American, and I did um, Rabbi Capers Fenier uh, with, with the comedian Aaron Friedman, and I think the first thing I said, I said, but you don't look Jewish. <laughs> so um, that's how we started our last show. Mm -hmm. And it's good that uh, you came here, and we're going to be, and I think uh, th there was Rabbi uh, Scheiman is a good person to talk to. He gives you, pre and I understand he gives you very good advice. But, you know, I just wanted to read something um, that was that came for me from Sweden, actually. The United States has the highest incar incarceration rate in the world. It has only 5% of the world's population, but one quarter of, of its prisoners. U.S. prisons are dangerously overcrowded, houses 10 times as many mentally in individuals as from state hospitals, keeps people locked up for long periods of time, and plagued by inmate abuse and a greater percentage of the country's black population, which I was very surprised. There, it's a bigger, bla uh, there, bigger country's black population than South Africa did under the apartheid. Uh, nearly two thirds of its inmates released every year to prison, and they they don't they come back. And uh, one of the reasons they they do come back into the system is because they're not getting any. You know, uh, you you have to you have to somehow you have to get college credits or or, or things that you know, just can't send a person home from prison right to their door. Tell us a little bit about that here, and I want to uh, tell the, you know, what that's all about. Well, one of the biggest problems with the Illinois criminal justice system is the criminalization of so many different things. You know, nonviolent crimes, uh, some of everything, and they send you to prison for almost anything here. Uh, the, the thing is, is that a, a lot of the model that they've used is, is, is a punishment model, where you eliminate rehabilitation and you and you call it punishment but what that's done is only created more and more problems the truth and sentencing laws that they came in with in, back in the 80s required that people with certain classes of felony or whatever would have to spend X amount of time in prison so now you have the system where there's no flexibility no good time for people and even if they did try to do good they've eliminated the education system out of most of the prisons in Illinois and you were you took advantage at that time of the education system that they did yeah. have, and because uh, at that time uh, prisons had money, a little bit more money than they have now, uh, because there's so many prisoners, and you have um, you took your uh, your high school, you got your high school out of it, you 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 got two bachelor's degrees. Yes, I did. It, and you're also going to be working on your master's. Well, at some point, if I, if I choose to continue that, but I, I've actually got a trade now, and I, I like my trade, and I'm an artist, so I'm not necessarily wanting to go to school too much anymore. I'm, I'm kind of up there in age, so. Uh, you you know. You're never too old. Well, you can always learn yeah. more, you know. And so, but you have your, you have your bachelor's, you have two bachelor's, mm -hmm. and you, you do electri electrical work, and I also see that he is a community organizer. Rabbi, how did you get, when Aaron came to you many years ago, how did, you really helped him, and you help a lot of people. What did you do for Aaron that, you know, got him to be where he is today? 
Um, I would say that Aaron, in addition to everybody else that I meet, the key component is the um, looking past the surface and being totally not judgmental and looking deep into someone's soul and loving them unconditionally no matter what they've done and um, getting such a bond with them where they open up and they search deeper and reveal things and find out things about themselves that they may never have spoken about to anybody else or they may have never thought about. And once that's revealed, the opening to change their life, because first you have to face what the issue is, the core issues, then you could change. And in addition to that, I, uh, together with Aaron and all the other men and women that come out, the Hindu Institute, we have now a rabbi hired to continue mentoring and working with each individual upon release. Um, and I think it was 20, 1991 when I first met you. Yes, I met you for six years, and since then you've been out for the last 20 years. And for those 20 years, we are in constant contact. Aaron's been to my house, he's been to my birthday parties, he's been to my synagogue, to Yom Kippur services. Um, and we've had different, we're about to embark on a program together on the south side of Chicago to help people in the community uh, in South Shore and uh, to be able to um, replicate what I do with Jewish inmates, with gentlemen such as Aaron, and I think what I do can work for any human, for any person. And we could replicate what they're doing in those other countries. Yes, I, yeah, I would like to know what, Aaron, what are you going to be doing with the rabbi? What are your plans? I, I hear you're going to be doing uh, community service. You have a lot of things that you're going to be doing with rabbi in the area. Because we hear so much of children, ch kids killing kids, people, you know, coming out of the, the, the area and they have nothing to do. You know, people go to prison for different reasons. And I guess one of the reasons that I think, um, and I'm sure this is one of them, is that people, they have nothing to look forward to. And, you know, there are gangs out there. There is maybe no parent figure in their life. Uh, and so the gangs represent a pin actually a parent figure. I mean, even it's something so negative as a gang, yet it somehow supports somebody and they make them feel good about themselves. So what are you going to be doing that they don't have to go to gangs anymore, they don't have to look for that? And what, are, what is your ideas with the rabbi that you're going to complete? Well, we're, we're looking at a lot of different options. We're, we're, we're looking at the idea of providing mentoring programs. Uh, people who may want to volunteer to mentor young people in the community. We want to deal with uh, programs that offer apprenticeships to help people get into the trades and uh, other aspects of, of, of work life. The, the gang problem is pretty intractable over there in, in, in most of the neighborhoods, but we, we've got to at least try to uh, present an image where people want to come in, not because they're being told, okay, this is bad for you and this is good for you, but they'll see the example and then want to be able to, to live by that example. Uh, I can say that having gone through most of the social service programs in the city of Chicago that were available, and with the help of Rabbi Scheinman when I got out, I found out what the the, the problems are in offering services to the community. How did you find that? Because I think we talked about, we all had lunch today, and we were talking about, uh, actually we were talking about a cousin of mine that really doesn't know how to find social services. How did you do that? How do people, when they come out, uh, they, they don't know where to go. They don't know what to do. Um, in, in my cousin's situation, she, somebody, her husband passed away at a young age, and she was left with three little kids, and she didn't know where to go or what to do. How did you organize this? How did you well, figure well, this out? While I was in prison, I, you know, I was very proactive, and I worked with the administration on pre-release programs for guys getting ready to get out. Say they were maybe 90 days before they were getting out. What we would do is we would offer them job job training. 
Uh, we would try to find resources for them. And this was before we had the laptops and all that stuff there. So we had to write places and they would send us their information. Places like St. Leonard's House uh, or what, what was the, uh, the, the one Safer Foundation and Safer, yes. other places like that. But there, w there were a lot more smaller mm -hmm. community organizations that were out there that people didn't really know anything about. So I started collecting a list of all of these programs and before I even hit the street, I knew who I was going to go see, where they were going to be at, what time I was going to mm -hmm. see them, because I wrote letters to these organizations. Now this stuff is available online, and then there are organizations like, uh, there's one organization, I don't know the name of it right off the top of my head, but it's up in broad, on Broadway up in uh, Uptown. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they have literally books and books of resources for all the programs in the city of Chicago that people can come in and they can find out, say you need dental care, say you need a doctor, you need eyeglasses, mm -hmm. you need clothing. You know, these people actually are a clearinghouse for all those kinds of things. The idea that somebody has this stuff somewhere centralized is something that's important, but it needs to be shared with everybody. It doesn't just right. need to be in uptown. Yeah, because if it's <laughs> even if it's in books, or, you know, say it's in books or it's online, people don't know where to go. They need somebody, a mentor. They need somebody, mm -hmm. a real-life person. You know, like a lot of these commercials now, they advertise insurance companies, and you get a real-life person, mm -hmm. you know, that you're talking to, and you're not talking to a computer. And I think uh, that is something that you were doing that. You were mentoring these people mm -hmm. before they came out. Hey, this is where this place is. If you need dental care, this is where you go. If you need this. And did you ever, you know, I, I think both of you men should write a book. You should be <laughs> writing a book on, on how to get all these things because a lot of people do not know that these things even exist. And, um, you know, it, not so much even for people that are coming out of prison, but people that are in new type situations where their their spouses pass away and they they're left they don't know what to do they don't have the money and they're they're, they're left you know without uh, care but they're not really left without care they just don't know that they can find exactly. that they have it. Well, the Hindu Institute, is, is, you know, they work with prisoners coming home, so we want to be able to expand that base. That, that program, especially into the South Side and wherever else we could do that. Because uh, the people who are, are supporting us, they say if we can do it in one place, they're willing to help us to do it in another place and another place and another place. We want to stretch over into Chatham. We want to stretch over into Inglewood. We want to get into all the neighborhoods, but first we have to have that one perfectly oiled working machine of a program. And Hindu does have that world. Yes, they that, do. That, uh, Right. right. And right. Another, another aspect uh, uh, that you had mentioned is a spouse losing a husband to illness or to death is similar in a way to some of the spouses lose their husband for 20 years to a prison. Mm -hmm. And they don't know where to turn. So we also mm -hmm. have oh. people on staff that particularly work with mothers and with wives and with children because they need so much support. Because like right. you had mentioned before, how is anybody's, nobody is expecting to lose somebody to an incarceration. And it could be in a way worse than all the other um, things we mentioned because there's widow support groups and there's all types of support groups in the hospital for right. people on, with illness. But this whole support for someone that is incarcerated, that's not um, found. And mo right. since most of the families I meet are of uh, Jewish families in the North Shore or in the different neighborhoods, it's unheard of. Who ever heard of somebody going to prison? So people are really clueless, and we are there for them. Right, and and the, and the the father was the main. It could have been she had little kids, and the father is the main support of the family, and they don't know what to do. The, you know, all of a sudden, my husband is incarcerated for. 20 years, how do I, how do, and I'm not, I'm not working, I'm taking care of little kids, what do I do now? It's surprising that there are so many people in that condition. I mean, it's like millions of people across the country going through that right now. And this is where the mentoring comes in. We have to have people who are willing to work with their children. We have to have people who are willing to work with the parents to help them find those resources like we talked about earlier. But we don't, we don't want to just limit it to prisoners. You know, we want to, lim we want, we want to work with people who have uh, alcohol problems and drug problems. Mm -hmm. We want to 
we, we, we've even got uh, adults who are professionals who haven't got their high school diplomas yet. Bus drivers and, and people with, with, with careers. And help them get their GEDs. And get their GEDs. Now, there's right. programs available, but they don't know about them. They don't know about it. <laughs> Right. Yeah, because... Not GED, you, high school diplomas. I'm yeah, sorry. The high, yeah, that's the... Isn't the, that actual, the, the actual high, high school, school diploma. Okay. Two different things. Yeah. Also, um, you know, um, what I was going to ask you is... Um, you had mentioned earlier that people do not go to prison. The re they may maybe a drug they go to because they do drugs or get caught selling drugs or, or even you know, other more violent crimes. But you said something that they don't go for one thing. It's never one thing. No. It never happens. You know the drug problem happens because some other problem is going on in their life. Mm -hmm. Is that? Is that what you're, you told me? Yeah, uh, th there's multitudes of reasons. And sometimes you'll find people who are in prisons for, uh, who've been incarcerated three and four times, but three and four different things. Mm -hmm. Theft, uh, 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 how about sleeping on the street and getting a ticket and can't pay it, and you go to jail and the next thing you know you get into an altercation in jail and you get more time. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the system that, 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 that literally traps people in a lot of cases. That's interesting. And people go to jail, you know, people don't jo just rob somebody. There's the other things going on in their lives, too, and I think that mental needs health. to... Mental health, many times. Yes. A mental <coughs> health problem that was not diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and our prisons have become the yeah. place where we throw in our mental, mentally ill, just put them in prison, get yeah. them off the streets. Right. Or they yeah. put drug offenders with uh, hardcore murderers. Yes. And that, you know, and, you know, maybe they just sold some marijuana. You know, now marijuana is, uh, well, it depends on what state. I think Illinois is just for, uh, you know, for, uh, for drug, not for drug, but for illnesses that you can use marijuana, but, but not recreational, pharmaceutical marijuana. I well, they, they did change the law in the city of Chicago and the Cook County where you can have only so much on you and they'll give you a traffic ticket. Mm -hmm. But before what they would do is they would take you into jail for the smallest amount and you'd sit there for months. Months. <laughs> months. For, for like uh, a fingernail sized piece of marijuana. And you're sitting there with people that did, they're doing for hardcore crimes and mm -hmm. they're sitting there for a little bit of, and now it's uh, legal in most states and then it wasn't. Um, so how, and, and I think it's one of you mentioned about there, there are sometimes people, they can't pay their, um, huh. their but right. you, at Cook County Jail, yes. if you go in, um, you, sometimes you have a very, very low bond to pay to go out and fight your case from the street. And um, before the present administration at the jail and the county took over, there were over 10,000 people daily in Cook County Jail, and with a few um, changes, tweaking the bonding process, making it easier for people, the Cook County Jail has reduced um, maybe to 8,000 or less a day, and they've closed down buildings, and that was all just um, helping people um, be, have the ability to go out on bond and stay at home until their case is mm -hmm. comes to court and you Instead mentioned there was a guy that was five dollars and he didn't even know that remember you were we were talking right, that about that was somewhere that? in right in, in new york in rikers jail there was someone at a five dollar bond didn't even know what his mom was and <laughs> sat in the jail mm -hmm. and just sitting in jail is no good you're away from home and other things happen yeah and i and i i think one of my questions were was at that when you said that to me i said well what about his lawyer and I got really got feedback about the lawyer, right? Well, you know, public defenders are pretty much over, overwhelmed, and a lot of times, a lot of their clients slip through the cracks. And I don't think they're out looking for uh, bond for a lot of their people. Ba basically, they're just try trying to manage cases. I think uh, the, the gentleman uh, Willie Wilson uh, from the South Side, he has started a program where if you have a low bond and a nonviolent offense. They have now people coming into the jails to find out if you're in there just stuck like that. Because we have a lot of people who are stuck there. And that's cutting down on the amount of, uh, of inmate population as well. You know, when I was, mm -hmm. when we were talking about Sweden, and um, I don't know if, if you could get a picture of this, but um, 
is can one of the cameras pick up on this? I don't know. It's this is this is a Swedish prison, and I'll describe it if you can't get close to it. And it looks like a dorm. It looks like a college dorm. Shelby. Everybody gets a, a <laughs> night, a, a, a twin bed, and a desk, and a really nice desk, and a bookcase with which you could uh, put your books. And this is the prison system, by the way, in Sweden. And I think also Finland has a very, uh, also has a prison system like this as well. And here you're thinking, and our prisons are overpacked, overcrowded. The people are sleeping in one. What? Terrible conditions. Well, literally, you, this 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 room here is the size of <clears throat> a standard jail cell in any any jail in America. And you take out the cell, uh, the, the shelving, you take out the uh, desk, you put a toilet in there, and four beds on each wall, and one guy in each bed, and you may even have a guy sleeping on the floor. Oh my goodness! That's the difference between there and here. <laughs> yeah, this is just for one. This room is just for one man. Right. That one, would be a four, a, a four person room in the United yeah, States. Yeah, and this is a, this is a one person room, and it looks like a college dorm. Mm -hmm. And the and and it's um, you know, and, and I understand they they don't even wear uniforms. They have tennis tables, pool tables, darts, aquariums. I mean, everything to make the person, when they come out, that they feel like a person again and we not a criminal. Like that, didn't we? And, Diana Correctional yeah. Center? That, that yeah. used to be like and, that. Uh, also, yeah. And also, we, we talked about that, um, you know, that you have to give somebody, you have to train people. You can't just let people go off on the streets. You know, that, that is so um, unfortunate. And the other thing is, how do they, uh, if you have an, a record, how do you rent an apartment for yourself when you get out? It's difficult for some people. How do you get a job? Because they look, they, they ask for your criminal record every, you know, have you committed a crime on every application? Yeah, well, we, we have a real estate agent on contract at the Hind Institute that specifically will look for rentals for felons and it is difficult but the families can contact him beforehand and he'll look for uh, places and I have a, I just added a new employer this week a, a uh, ex-offender who got out he's been out successfully he's opening his own company and he called me up very proudly that I can now send he'll hire felons he'll hire anybody coming out that I recommend so we have um, employers and we are trying housing is very hard